Virginians knew that the spring would bring something new. Lincoln had called his best commander to the east. Ulysses S. Grant would not be like others. He did not let a setback stop him in his course. Throughout the winter, Lee tried to predict where and how Grant would strike. May 1864 was only a few days old before he found out. The wilderness is a strange and foreboding place. 12 miles long, 6 miles wide, it is filled with second growth timber, dense undergrowth and vines. Only one or two roads pass through it and clearings where artillery can be used are few and far between. There's no such thing as having a big bottle in an area like this. In short, the wilderness was a place no army should be. Two days of vicious fighting occurred here in the wilderness with both sides delivering attacks and counterattacks. Bullets set the trees on fire and dozens of wounded soldiers were burned alive. Finally, Grant withdrew to try another way to get around Lee. Lee himself fell back to Spotsylvania and another battle. When Grant realized that he could not defeat Lee in the wilderness, he shifted his army around Lee's right flank, trying to get between Lee and Richmond. The move took him into yet more dense woods, where once again the terrain worked to Lee's advantage. In May of 1864, the war moved into this countryside where we're standing from the wilderness. And unlike the battles that had preceded it for three years, this battle lasted for 14 days, inclusive. it lasted for two weeks. It was a tremendous change in the way that men had fought. And one aspect of this change had to do with earthworks. And at the nose of the Confederate defensive line, which came to be known as the Bloody Angle, there was fighting that raged on for 20 hours at hand-to-hand -hand range. Within sight of where I am today, about 2,500 Confederates and about 6,000 Federals fought under those circumstances all day long. When it was done, the Confederates fell back southward to a new earthwork line that had been constructed while they made this sacrifice all through the 12th of May for 20 hours. And the battle continued thereafter for nine more days until the war moved on southward. Meanwhile, a Union raid swept up the Shenandoah Valley to destroy the crops before the harvest and to open a back door through the Blue Ridge Mountains to move against Lee. When the raid began, the valley was all but undefended. But then, a general who had once been Vice President of the United States and a hastily assembled little army of bits and pieces from all over the valley in southwest Virginia rushed to meet the threat. The VMI Cadet Corps would be called away from its classrooms on, in May of 1864. They would march four days through the rain, 80 miles, to where they and the rest of the Confederate Army under the command of General John Breckinridge would enjoin the Union forces under Franz Siegel across Jacob and Sarah Bushong's farm, their orchard and their wheat field. The cadets would charge in the infantry attack that Sunday afternoon. At the end of the day, 10 cadets would die as a result of their participation. But General Breckinridge came back to celebrate the cadets for the victory that he enjoyed there in the beginning of the campaign of 1864. After Spotsylvania, Grant kept hammering at Lee and Lee kept holding on. Grant was too determined to turn back and Lee was too resourceful to be beaten. Finally, in frustration, Grant resorted to the once sort of action he always tried to avoid. Beginning of June in 1864, U.S. Grant and his Army of the Potomac arrived in the northern outskirts of Richmond and faced the task of driving Lee away from his defense of the capital. In doing so, Grant, I believe, slipped the leash. He'd been frustrated by his first month facing Lee and decided just to hammer right straight ahead. And at Cold Harbor, several thousand of his troops paid for that determination as he threw them forward against strongly entrenched Confederate positions and made Cold Harbor a deadly name that rings through the annals of the war. The frontal attacks were shot down in bloody ruin, thousands of men injured in the process, and Cold Harbor started what became a many months long siege of Richmond and Petersburg. Following his mangling at Cold Harbor, Grant once more resorted to what he did best, maneuver and surprise. 
Since he could not push Lee aside with his guns, he determined to get around him without firing a shot by using his engineers and his imagination. Whenever Grant hit a tough obstacle, he resorted to strategy. Unable to punch his way through Lee's army at Cold Harbor, Grant sent his engineers off to his left to the bank of the James, and in the next eight hours, they built a bridge 2,000 feet long, one of the greatest engineering feats in military history. By June 16th, most of Grant's army was on the other side of the James River, marching toward an unprotected Richmond. And now the key for both sides would be who got to Petersburg first. The crossing of the James put Grant on the road to Petersburg, the back door to Richmond. But just on the verge of taking Petersburg without a fight, he met a determined scratch force of defenders. As Lee extended and strengthened the defense of Petersburg and Richmond, and as Grant slowly dug in facing Lee, the Virginia War would enter a whole new phase. The trenches around Petersburg extended to the west and the south as General Grant tried to capture one by one each wagon road and railroad leading into the city. General Lee was obligated to protect the back door to Richmond, and so he was pinned down. General Grant had learned not to attack the powerful fortifications of the Confederates head on, and so relied on the occasional expedition around Lee's flanks. The soldiers constantly improved and expanded their fortifications, and both sides settled down to a tedious siege-like operation that had replaced the constant fighting earlier in the year. No one in either army has been in a siege thus far in this war. No one except Grant, that is, for he had employed a siege of 47 days to take Vicksburg, Mississippi a year before. The soldiers in the Army of Northern Virginia would have to learn a new way of fighting. Siege warfare was full of hardships for Civil War soldiers. They had to stand behind crude earthworks subjected to enemy fire at all times. They had to do so in all kinds of weather, from hot to freezing, from wet to dry. The living conditions were generally meant 24 hours of duty. You just could not afford to leave your position because you created the gap. So you were on the lines constantly. And that had to have the serious effects on the nerves as well as the physical being of the soldier. Always at the mercy of the element, and most of all at the mercy of the enemy, who can sling in mortar shells, uh, sniper fire, sharpshooter. So they were always in risk of their life while they were undergoing all of these physical disabilities. Grant wanted to end the war in 1864 without a long siege. Then a Pennsylvania coal miner suggested digging a tunnel across to and beneath the Confederate fortifications. A few weeks after the Army settled in for siege warfare here around Petersburg, a group of Union soldiers who had been coal miners in Pennsylvania before the war came up with an idea of tunneling under the Confederate position, filling the end of the tunnel with gunpowder and blowing up the Confederate lines. And on July 30th, 1864, the powder charge was detonated, killing and wounding over 270 78 Confederate soldiers. The crater that was formed was approximately 160 feet long, 60 feet wide, and 30 feet deep. Union troops charged into and around the crater, but quick reacting Confederate troops made a counterattack and coming over the tops of the crater here uh, kept the Union troops from advancing any further. The battle for the Union troops was uh, unsuccessful, thus causing General Grant to say it was the saddest affair he had ever witnessed in the war. Virginians found their soil invaded from another direction at the same time. After Newmarket, the Shenandoah was safe for a few weeks, but in June, another Union threat appeared and this time there was almost no one to stop it. Soon, they reached Lexington. By June of 1864, a new Union general, David Hunter, is placed in that position. He's moving 
up the valley and arrives in Lexington, home of VMI, on June the 11th, 1864. While Hunter is here, he orders the destruction of the Institute. Completely shelled and burned, the cadets would have to find a new home after Hunter's uh, departure. He leaves on the morning of June the 14th, headed to Lynchburg, where just a few weeks later would be the definitive battle of the Battle of Lynchburg, and David Hunter would move out of the valley for the remainder of the war. After the failure at the crater, Lee tried a gamble. He sent General Jubal Early's Corps west and then north across the Potomac into Maryland. Their goal, Washington. Lee counted on a threat to that city to force Grant to weaken his forces around Petersburg to save Lincoln's capital. By July, Early's raid was well on the road to Washington with no resistance in his path. Early's battle-hardened veterans came out of the Shenandoah Valley and turned east toward Washington. Near chaos filled the Union capital. Federal authorities ordered General Grant to send up reinforcements all the way from the Richmond-Petersburg front. Early got as far east as the Monocacy River in Maryland when he encountered a kind of jumbled mixture of Union troops who put up a pretty spirited fight for a day until they were overrun by Confederate numbers. By the time Early got to the outskirts of Washington, however, that 24-hour fight at Monocacy had given the Union authorities time to be ready. And the trenches of Washington were so filled with Union soldiers that Early gave up the attempt. He withdrew to the Shenandoah Valley. Washington was saved. Never again would the Union capital be threatened. Forced to withdraw back into Virginia, Early could not rejoin Lee because Grant sent a powerful new force to clean out the valley once and for all, a force commanded by General Philip H. Sheridan. On September 19th, Sheridan attacked Early at Winchester, broke his lines, and sent him retreating southward. Three days later, Sheridan struck again at Fisher's Hill, again broke the Confederate lines, and Early retreated farther southward. Sheridan was now convinced that Early no longer was a threat, and so he encamped the Union Army at Cedar Creek, 20 miles south of Winchester. Then he himself made a visit to Washington. On the morning of October 19th, Sheridan left Winchester and leisurely made his way toward the Union encampment at Cedar Creek. Suddenly he saw fragments of his army rushing toward him. It seems that Early had attacked the Union encampment, caught it by surprise, and sent the Federals in retreat. The little man with the black hair on a big black horse became enraged. He hollered for the men to rally around him. He got the army back together again and launched a ferocious counterattack that drove Early from the field. Indeed, the Confederate forces in the Valley of Virginia ceased to exist, and the Shenandoah belonged to Philip Sheridan. The siege at Petersburg dragged on into the new year. One by one, Grant cut off Lee's supply and escape routes to the west. By February 1865, Lee knew that time was running out. Once more, he determined on a gamble. In the spring of 1865, General Lee realized that General Grant's army was preparing to go after his last supply line, the Southside Railroad. Consequently, he made an attack on Union Fort Stedman. Early dawn on March 25th, 1865, Lee's forces made the attack on this fort. They did so successfully and were able to press uh, further into the Union lines. But quick marching Union troops made a counterattack and pushed the Confederates back to their lines and the battle was unsuccessful for Lee's army. And at this point, the Confederate soldier was fighting for about one thing, and that was a man named Robert E. Lee. By April 1, 1865, Grant was ready to make the final push. Now Lee had only one remaining railroad line to the outside world. If that was cut, he'd be trapped, and the government in Richmond would be cut off from escape. The key to that last railroad was a small crossroads known locally as Five Forks. General Grant's army began heading after Lee's last supply line into the city, the Southside Railroad. 
As they left their trenches, they marched through Dinwiddie County to an important crossroads known as Five Forks. The Union forces attacked, and in two hours, the Confederate Army withdrew from Five Forks, and the road was now open to capture the railroad the next day. As soon as Grant received word of the victory at Five Forks, he knew what he had to do. Lee had to have weakened his center. And so Grant will order an all-out assault on Lee's center, knowing that if he broke the army in half, he could take Petersburg and take Richmond and put Lee and his army on the run. On the gloomy morning of April 2nd, 1865, some 14,000 Union soldiers targeted the fortifications behind me in a bold attempt to break Robert E. Lee's defense lines around Petersburg. The attack began just before dawn, and 1,100 Federal soldiers fell in 15 minutes of furious fighting. Eventually, those Yankees were able to ascend the works and grapple with the Confederate soldiers hand to hand, overwhelming them, compelling General Lee to send a message to President Davis in Richmond that Richmond and Petersburg would have to be evacuated that day. There was no delaying any longer. President Davis and the government would have to flee from Richmond and the city itself must be evacuated. It was April the 2nd, 1865, when President Davis first learned that he would have to evacuate the capital. He was sitting in his usual pew at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. A messenger from the War Department arrived at the back of the church and handed a message to an usher who walked down the aisle and gave it to Davis. And that's when he learned that he would have to evacuate the government that night. Several weeks before the actual evacuation of Richmond, Confederate Army officers had laid plans for destroying the government-owned tobacco plus the arsenal plus the railroad bridges across Richmond. And they, they actually had detailed specific soldiers to carry out those plans, and they followed them. The word spread very quickly uh, through town that the government was packing up to leave. Most civilians then had to decide what to do, whether to stay or to leave. Many of them packed up and fled across Mayo's Bridge south across the James River, but probably most civilians decided to stay in town. By dawn on the morning of the 3rd, most of the soldiers had crossed Mayo's Bridge to the south side, and that's when the Confederate engineers began to light the fires. The evacuation fire was a great calamity for Richmond, and if you looked out from Capitol Square, you saw a sea of smoldering ashes, and tottering brick chimneys. But in fact, the fire only burned one-tenth of the built-up area of Richmond. Even so, that one-tenth constituted nine-tenths of the business district. So all of the jobs went up in smoke. Now, Lee had to move fast, find supplies along the way, and head west toward Lynchburg or south into North Carolina, even if he had to abandon Virginia. But he could not afford to lose any time or to lose another man. When General Lee's army did not receive the awaiting rations at Amelia Courthouse, the general withdrew his army and headed west towards Farmville, where he learned that rations were awaiting his army there. In doing so, it brought him through the bottomlands of a small creek called Sailor's Creek. Soon, Union forces would attack him on three fronts there. Lee would lose almost a quarter of his army, close to 7,700 men, along with eight Confederate generals who would surrender that evening. General Lee, seeing the disaster, remarked, my God, has this army dissolved. Lee's only hope, as April 9th dawned, was that he could punch a hole through Grant's cavalry to his west and escape toward Lynchburg. The problem was he didn't know if it was just cavalry out there or was there infantry behind it. He ordered John Gordon and Fitzhugh Lee to take what few troops they could muster, no more than about 2,500, and launch an assault. At first it went well. It was Union cavalry, and gradually Gordon and Lee pushed the cavalry back. But when that cavalry retreated, what they saw was not an open road to Lynchburg, but more than 25,000 Union infantry in their way. Lee was trapped. It was out of the hands of the soldiers now. It remained to two generals to enact the final scene in an epic campaign that had pitted them against each other almost daily for the past 11 months. 
the war for Virginians had to come to an end sooner or later. Now was the time. This is the parlor of the Wilma McLean home at Appomattox Courthouse. This is where General Lee and General Grant came to talk about the possible surrender of the Confederate Army. This is where the Civil War would end. Lee was immaculately dressed at this table. Grant sat at that table in an old, rather beaten uniform. The conference lasted two hours. The terms of surrender were very generous. The horsemen would be able to keep their mounts. The officers would keep their sidearms. All the Confederate soldiers would be able to go home by authority of General Grant. There would be no prosecution for treason. There would be no revenge that would poison the peace. The terms of surrender were actually an act of kindness. And General Grant made it so when that afternoon he issued a short announcement to his army the Civil War is over. The rebels are our countrymen again. Civil wars don't normally end on such a high note. But thanks to Lee and Grant, this one was different. After accepting the terms of surrender, General Lee came out here onto the front porch of the McLean House. He accepted salutes from Union soldiers in the yard, mounted traveler, and rode back to tell his weeping army the news. Later in the day, he issued a farewell order, which closed, you have the satisfaction of consciousness of duty faithfully performed, and I earnestly pray that a merciful God will extend to you his blessings and his protection. And with that, Robert E. Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia rode into legend.